I'd like to really thank, first of all, everybody who's here, our sample audience tonight, as we're trying to identify really new ways to have interactive um, hybrid format meetings. And so um, I probably, this is illegal advertising, this is a thing called an owl, we're testing it out. I hope that we're gonna find a way to be able to reach as many people as possible and keep everybody in their comfort zone, either in person or in terms of being able to log in um, at home going forward. Just a couple of quick things. Of course, a shout out and a thank you to Brian, who's our community outreach chair, um, to Judy Beck, who runs our communications, and um, to Will Alvarez, who's here tonight and is rescuing everything technological in terms of going forward. We are the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center. We have over 60 faculty. Actually, we're cruising on to 70 now, um, big demand during COVID. Um, we span six schools, 21 departments, and our mission is very much like the rest of the UCI School of Medicine. Discover, teach, and heal. Of course, focused on stem cells and stem cell biology. Most of you who, maybe not necessarily the ones in this room, but people who've been tuning in to our previous live community lectures or to our virtual lecture series over the last year, 18 months, know that we had a big deal with relaunching CIRM, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine through Prop 14. That did happen in November of 2020, and we're now well on the way towards launching the rest of our initiatives that come from that. Most importantly, this June, we got out the first of the big requests for applications that are coming through, and that includes um, a new training grant, which we hope we're gonna hear about within the next month or two. Now we're gearing up to fund our core research labs, and of course, um, the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic, which we're very excited about, and Dr. Daniela Boda, who's the director of that clinic, is here tonight. How can you help? Well, you can participate, sign up for our e-newsletter, reach out to Judy, um, again, in terms of following us on Facebook, uh, uh, following us on our website, stemcells.uci.edu. Uh, and of course, um, we are always in the business of trying to sustain our enterprise, so please consider making a gift to the Stem Cell Research Center. Just to remind everyone, although I can't advocate in a particular direction, there is another important election coming up in California. This is a slide from the University of California Action Network, so please consider um, making sure that you vote in the election that's coming up. It's a big deal in terms of UC and UC system support. Two quick dates to throw out and highlight for you. For our current lecture series, October 5th will be our next evening lecture, 7 p.m. We're gonna feature Taloria Adams, who we're very excited is one of our faculty hires for leveraged research excellence, Flurry hires to the Stem Cell Research Center. And then on November 2nd, 7 p.m. again, both Tim Downing and Mike Zaragoza, who are gonna be talking about stem cells and aging. So we're looking forward to those events. We hope we'll be getting information out to you about being able to expand this hybrid opportunity, assuming that all goes well this evening. Tonight, though, I wanna introduce just quickly our two speakers. First, uh, I'm backwards in terms of my order, but Claire Henchcliffe, who came to UCI um, to be the new chair for the Department of Neurology. She has an extremely distinguished background, including degrees from Columbia and uh, three from Oxford. So how can you beat that? She was previously the Vice Chair for Clinical Research in Neurology and Chief of Neurodegenerative Disorders at the Weill Cornell um, School of Medicine. So we're really delighted to have her here and participating in our program. In addition to that, she's gonna to partner tonight with a basic scientist, Momoko Watarabe, who was a graduate school a student at UCI. We're very proud of that. Went on to UCLA and the Rican Institute, and we recruited back just recently to join us um, as faculty, again, through this program we're really excited about, Faculty Hires for Leveraged Research Excellence. The two of them together are gonna talk to us about organoids and the use of those organoids, their clinical potential going forward. And then just a couple words on format. So very much like doing a straight online lecture, I'm gonna ask everyone to hold their questions, mainly towards the end. You will have the opportunity to put questions in the Q&A box, but we're also gonna try and have a more live dynamic discussion at the end. But because we're in this hybrid format where we're testing out our new 3D camera and microphone system, we're gonna switch straight between the speakers and then have an open question and answer section um, at the end of the combined presentation. With that, I'm gonna thank everyone for joining us and ask Momoko, who is going to lead us off. Um, so I'm really thankful to a great research environment here. Uh, which has been really uh, enabled by the CERM support. 
So today I'm going to talk about brain organoids, lab-grown brains as new models to study neurological disorders. Um, I'm going to focus on basic science aspects of brain organoids. So why do we need human models to study the brain? Animal models that have been traditionally used are definitely useful to study some basic mechanisms of brain function and disease. At the same time, humans have very unique cognitive function that led to fantastic innovation uh, like st space exploration, expression of the in imagination like art. So how do humans obtain those unique cognitive function? It's likely from neuroanatomical differences between species. Here you're looking at um, various mammalian brain pictures highlighting how brain anatomy is different among, um, among the species. So first, the size of the brain is very different. Um, so here you can see the mouse, rat, rodent brains. It's very smooth right here. And actually, when you look at the primate brain, um, it's folded. So the number of neurons are actually significantly expanded from uh, 71 million to um, 86 billion. And um, so different brain um, types, such as neurons, astrocytes, uh, those, are, those are exhibit more complex structure, morphology, and diversity in primate brains. Also, the ratio of different brain types are different, and there are new um, cortical areas such as prefrontal lobes that are responsible for our language function. And there are many, many more. So perhaps due to many differences in brain anatomy and function, many drugs that have been developed and validated in animal models fail when given to patients. So it has been estimated to over 90% of drugs um, that have been validated in animal models fail. For example, um, the, in the stroke field, about 500 neuroprotective therapies were successful in rodents, but many of them fail at some stage of translation to humans, and actually only one treatment has been approved. When we think about the economic burden to the society, about $800 billion were spent for neurological disorders. So it is very important to introduce and innovate some human model systems before clinical trials. So how do these different brain structures are made? In order to understand that, we study how neurons are formed and give rise to neural circuits and perform brain function during development. So you can, here you can see, um, um, first, um, so this is a human cortex uh, initially formed. It's in scale, and then give rise to this complex adult, adult structure. And uh, those neurons form neural circuits and perform uh, function. So let me explain how brain cells are made at a cellular level. So here, um, um, large pool of neural stem cells or progenitors are initially formed, and then they can either expand themselves, so they divide and expand themselves, or terminally differentiate it to specialized cell called like neurons. Uh, those neurons uh, ex execute some special function, but usually they can't expand themselves. So neural stem cells they expand themselves, form different brain regions. They can also become secondary progenitors or differentiate to specialized cell types. And these secondary progenitors further can expand themselves and differentiate to specialized cell like neuron, astrocyte, oligodendrocytes, or the different type of progenitors. And furthermore, these progenitors can expand or terminally differentiate it to specialized cell. So these processes are highly regulated, and cells are organized into a very stereotypic manner to form architecture. 
So in the context of architecture, let me explain this so um, production in organization. So here you can see the um, fetal cortex. And as I mentioned, large pool of the neural stem cells are formed initially. They can expand themselves or give rise to neurons. And this is the progenitor region. And when they differentiate to neurons, those neurons can migrate away from this <coughs> progenitor region towards the neuronal region. And when we look at the, this neuronal region right here, those neurons are also organized in a very stereotypic manner to form this six-layered structure. Um, also, um, okay, sorry. Um, also, um, there are two main type of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory. And inhibitory neurons are also important to inhibit some um, excitation of the excitatory neurons. And those excitatory, um, in, uh, sorry, hmm. um, inhibitory neurons are actually generated from this ventral side of the brain and migrate towards the cortical um, region. And they fully form this neural network and execute brain function. Any errors in these processes can lead to neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, so that's why many neurological disorders can arise back in early development. So let me highlight what are the dif prominent difference between the primates and my um, rodent brains. So as I mentioned, there are different type of progenitors, primary progenitors and secondary progenitors, and a disease in neuronal layer. Okay, okay, um, okay. So, um, so here um, you can look at the secondary progenitor region, which is um, significantly expanded compared to the um, mice brain. Because of the expansion in the secondary progenitors, uh, it was sought to further expand the neuronal layers. And when we look at the neuronal layer right here, uh, the upper layer neurons are significantly expanded compared to the rodent brain. So the study of early human de development has been very challenging because of practical and ethical considerations. That's why the attention has been placed on the generation of models in a dish using human embryonic human induced pluripotent stem cells. So collectively, I will call them human PSCs. So human PSCs have the ability to become any type of the cell in our body. And we would like to direct, we would like to direct, um, sorry, the microphone is out. Okay. okay. So we would like to direct um, human PSCs to neural stem cells and then to towards neurons to form brain tissue. So historically, after these human ES cells are invented, um, James Thompson's lab also introduced the first neural induction. And in the two-dimensional culture, a lot of times those neurons are massively disorganized. It was really back in 2008 when Yoshiki Sasai's lab first showed the three-dimensional um, architecture um, from human ES cells. And back in 2013, uh, Noblich lab in Australia also showed three-dimensional tissue reconstruction from human ES cell and model microcephaly using patient-derived IBS cells. And actually they invented this terminology, organoid, um, and then also the size lab also show very improved region-specific organoids. After those two papers, brain organoid fuel um, has been uh, massively grown. Can you hear, hear me or, can you hear me? No, okay. Right. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so there are three major um, brain organoid protocols in the field, and um, they have different uh, uh, weakness and strengths. And let me um, go through the region-specific organoids. So for the sake of time, I won't go over the details of how we make the brain organized from ES cells, um, but after eight weeks of differentiation, this is how the brain organoid looks like. So this is a size of really rice grain. So when we take a cross section of brain organoid, um, you can see the um, this differentiation method is very efficient uh, and we can confirm that at a cellular level. When we look at the laminar architecture of brain organoids, uh, it really recapitulates the human fetal cortex right here. Thank you. Um, okay. Can you hear me better? Okay, all right. <laughs> So, um, so our group actually modified the previous um, region-specific organoid to further expand the secondary progenitor region called SPZ. So this is really recapitulating the human-specific feature to make the abundant secondary progenitors. We also have the ability to make different regions of the brain. So during the development, so neural stem cells or directed to different parts of the brain. So for example, if um, it, it's directed towards the dorsal part of the brain, it's wind and BMP signaling activate the stem cells to become the dorsal part of the brain. So in our culture, we can actually activate the ventral signaling and uh, make the um, ventral side of the brain called ganglionic eminence. And as I mentioned previously, ganglionic eminence produce inhibitory neurons, and we can confirm the cell identity at a cellular level. So let me um, introduce some attempts to model neurodevelopmental disorders using brain organoids. Back in 2015-16, there was a Zika virus outbreak. So babies born from mothers who were infected with Zika virus have this small brain called microcephaly. We thought the brain organoid system is perfect because brain organoid actually reflect the human fetal tissue. So we went ahead and infect the brain organoid with Zika virus as depicted in green right here. And interestingly, those Zika virus infect primary progenitors preferentially. So we infected brain organoids for two weeks, and when you look at the size of each individual organoid, the size is massively reduced. And when we look at the cell disk depicted in pink right here, um, it induces cell death. This really recapitulates the small brain phenotype. So we um, also use the platform to screen for compounds that can prevent the Zika virus infection as well as Zika virus induced cell deaths. So you can see the Zika virus um, infection in green here and cell deaths in, in red right here. So when we add a different type of compounds, we can see the prevention of Zika virus infection as well as Zika virus induced cell deaths. Um, so this is really showing that this organic platform could be very useful for um, viral infection and looking for the drugs that can prevent the infections. So we also tried to model Rett syndrome to look at neural circuit dysfunction. Can we really look at the neural circuit um, and model the disease? So Rett syndrome is an X-linked neurodevelopmental disorder, uh, show delayed milestone and intellectual disability. Interneuropathies are really prevalent, meaning that inhibitory neurons are usually affected in these diseases. And because of the dysfunction in inhibitory neurons, 
Seizures are prevalent in the majority of patients. So as I mentioned, we have a way to make cortical versus the GE-like organoids, and GE organoids produce inhibitory neurons. When we fuse those two organoids together, interestingly, those inhibitory neurons produced from the GE organoids migrate towards the cortical um, organoids and integrate into the excitatory network like in vivo system. We have a way to visualize the neuronal activities so here we are looking at the individual neurons and then those flash of lights suggest the neuronal activities. So we are looking at this cortical site and how the excitatory neurons are activated. So here we, uh, so this is the same field and we disinhibit the inhibitory neurons. And then you can start to see the massive flash of light suggesting that a lot of neurons are activated synchronously. So this synchronization of excitatory neurons or seizure-like events in patients. So we can model the seizure-like events in the dish. So here are uh, summary plots showing the previous video. So red, um, orange um, showing the activated neurons. So by this inhibit the inhibitory neurons, we can start to see the synchronous activities, remission of seizure-like events in patients. So when we make the fusion organoids using the uh, Rett syndrome patient-derived um, patient iPS cell and make the fusion, we can actually recapitulate these synchronous activities and use this platform to look for drug that can uh, mediate these synchronous activities. So to summarize, uh, brain organoids um, as a powerful platform to understand human development and disease, and brain organoids as a reliable predictor of drug discovery. And in the future, we would like to further mimic bare cell types and brain regions. And I didn't mention much about long-term cultures, but it's been challenging to maintain a good quality organoids in the long run. So we would like to borrow some bioengineering technology to further improve this brain organoid technology. With that, I would like to thank um, um, support from Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center, as well as my former um, mentor, Ben Novich at UCLA, and some collaborators who enabled the Zika virus study and funding source. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, everyone. We're sorting through. Remember, we're all in an adventure tonight together, <laughs> figuring this out. I am going to go ahead and pull up Dr. Henchcliffe's slides. Um, Momoko, I'm so impressed by, by your talk. And uh, this science is very exciting and, and really wonderful. Um, so I'm actually going to address some of the same questions that Momoko was um, speaking to. But I'm going to come at it from a different perspective because my background is really as a clinical researcher. I've been involved in stem cell research for probably around a decade. But this is really something new and really something exciting. Um, so I wanted to speak about, you know, brain organoids. The science is absolutely wonderful. But might they help our patients? So I, I want to give a, a clinical perspective here. And um, I want to back up and flesh out some of the things that Momoko was talking about earlier, which is we don't really have good enough windows on the human brain. We could really do better. And studying the human brain is a challenge. And, um, you know, it's, it's a squishy organ. It's encased in a thick, hard skull, put in the average thicknesses. Women are a little bit harder headed than men. Um, here's our skull. And everything that we want to look at is kind of sitting inside there, hidden from view. Well, not quite. I'll show you some ways that we can um, look at it. And here, here's an x-ray. And again, the x-ray doesn't really tell us so much about what we want to know when the brain is functioning and when it's not functioning the way that it should be. So um, autopsy, um, I, I'm going to run through a few of the ways that we have of being able to study the human brain. Um, just very quickly so that I can illustrate the limitations and kind of speak to why I think this is really exciting work. Um, 
So first of all, autopsies, and I, I couldn't resist. Um, I have a favorite neuroanatomist, which may, may sound strange, um, but he uh, made some beautiful illust illustrations. This is way back in the late um, 18th century. And you can see here with the top of the skull removed, um, how complex the structure of the adult brain is, even to the naked eye, right? And if you lift it out of the skull, again, this complexity, you can see the vasculature here, um, very complex, relatively reproducible from person to person, but always with differences. And another way of looking at the brain structure is then to kind of slice through and look at different levels. And even with the naked eye, you get this picture of really an enormous complexity. So you can see here the convolutions of the cortex that uh, Momoko was showing you some of the um, uh, some micro, uh, um, microscopic um, images of that before. What I'm going to be talking about is a little bit complementary because rather than talking about children and neurodevelopmental issues, I want to look at the opposite end of the spectrum and talk about neurodegenerative disorders, which I see in my patients. I really focus on uh, Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases. And um, second of all, rather than looking at cortex, that means that a lot of the movement um, deficits that we see in movement disorders like Parkinson's come from the deep structures. The cortex is affected as well, but we're going to be looking at different parts of the brain. So um, learning from uh, autopsy, you know, we can look at multiple different types of cells. We can look at the processes, but it, it's really kind of a snapshot. This is um, just a little background here because I am going to be showing you some examples of how I think organoids um, could be helpful in Parkinson's disease. So just to set the stage, um, this was published a long time ago, but basically you'll see again what we can learn from autopsy. This is a little bit of midbrain right here, substantia nigra, and I hope you can see this. This kind of little ridge of um, dark pigmented cells. These are the guys who are making dopamine and delivering the dopamine to these deep gray matter structures, basal ganglia, deep down within the hemisphere. And you can see even with the naked eye that uh, for someone with Parkinson's, they've, the, the pigmentation is less. They've lost a lot of those cells. And um, that kind of goes along with this uh, development to the classic pathology of Parkinson's disease, which are these little protein globs. They're misfolded, multiple different misfolded and um, damaged proteins. But basically, alpha-synuclein is a key component there. And we're going to be coming back to that in a second. So autopsy can give you snapshots. It, it's very limited in terms of you know, telling us what happens over time. But there have been examples where people could construct hypotheses by looking at multiple autopsy specimens. And Heiko Breck did just that back in 2002, where he looked at brains that had the alpha-synuclein pathology but may or may not have had Parkinson's. And he figured out a, a kind of construct, a hypothesis of how this might develop. Well, this is the sort of thing where we have, so th this is to illustrate how many limitations we have in, in terms of uh, following what's going on in the brain. So we're not limited to autopsy. We have multiple biomarkers. Neuroimaging biomarkers can show structure, function, activity, and you can scan people multiple times over their existence. Right. Um, so we've got CT, example here, MRI shows this wonderful um, structural complexity. But when you want to start looking at the um, individual cell types or the individual neurotransmitters, then oftentimes we, we switch into um, nuclear imaging using SPECT and PET scans. And there's an example here, and you know, this is again um, a dopamine-based example in Parkinson's. This is a um, radio ligand that binds onto uh, dopamine cells. Um, it's, it binds onto something called the dopamine active transporter. And when you have someone who's healthy, this is what you see. It looks like a, a, a red, intensely red tadpole, basically. The head of the tadpole is the chordate, and the tail of the tadpole is the putamen. And um, this really reflects the terminals of the dopamine neurons, where you have this dopamine active transporter present, and that's where the dopamine is getting delivered. And look what happens in Parkinson's. You just don't see so much of that. You've lost the tail of the tadpole, so you're kind of losing those posterior portions of the putamen. And um, just incidentally, this is taken from one of our papers where we were thinking about cell transplants, and we just had one of our 
we just had our first patient uh, head out to New York um, as part of a, a transplant trial. As part of that, shout out to Alpha Stem Cell Clinic and Dr. Bota, who've been helping me with this. Okay, so what we can do, like I said, is we can scan people multiple times. And actually here, um, this is a massive amount of work, just reduced to one tiny little diagram, but using three different radio ligands to study the progressive loss of dopamine. But again, it's kind of limited, right? You're just looking at one cell type, you're not really looking at what's going on with its interactions, you're not looking at the pathology within there. And we don't have, you know, alpha-synuclein is so key to Parkinson's, but we don't have a radio ligand that will pick that up. So, um, again, speaking to complexity, even if I just look at Parkinson's disease, one disease, but there are many neurochemicals involved, many cell types involved. These are some of the scans that we had looked at when I was back in New York. You can see differences in glutamate receptors. Here's our dopamine. This is something looking at microglial activation, um, PK11195. And here's something that I just want to highlight as a taste of what I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes. This is an old study looking at a scan that picks up Alzheimer's-like pathology in people with uh, Parkinson's, but dementia on top. And across the rows, we've got patient number one, across here, patient number two here, three here, four here. Look at the differences. So everyone with Parkinson's, everyone with dementia, but differences in the pathology. And we don't know why. And this is really where I think we need to be looking at a more precise way of defining what people um, are suffering from in terms of the root cause of the phenotype that you're seeing. So um, last couple of things. We are somewhat limited in the types of radio ligands that we have. We can't look at some proteins. There are some chemicals we can't look at. Fluid-based brain bi bi biomarkers allow us to look at a much broader range. So you can get the um, cerebrospinal fluid out uh, using a spinal tap like here. This is nice, healthy looking, clear CSF. And you can run any test that you want, basically. Here's just an example of some Alzheimer's markers. So we can start to look at a broader range of chemicals, but then you sort of lose the geography. So you know that there may be an abnormality, but you don't know which specific region of the brain it's coming from. And then lastly, and this is going back to um, Momoko's talk, we have many human models that have been used to try to understand better, um, many animal models that have been used to try to understand better what's going on in human disease. And if I look at the example of Parkinson's, a model that's been very widely used is called the MPTP model. It's a toxin model of Parkinson's. You lose dopamine. So it's a great model if you want to study how to treat dopamine loss. But if you want to study the root cause of Parkinson's, it's not that helpful. And so this is a slide from Hubert Fernandez of, I, I mean, just multiple, multiple millions of dollars that have been spent on large scale clinical trials where there's been fantastic preclinical evidence that these drugs worked and they just did not translate through. So I think one of the problems is we're not always using the right animal models and the other problem, and I'm going to hark back to this again and again, is that we can't just lump people together with a particular diagnosis, like, for example, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. There are nuances, there are differences between different people with those diagnoses. They're different in terms of their genetic makeup, they're different in, t different in terms of the environmental exposures they've had, and the difference in, in terms of their experience. So it feels like we're developing a lot of treatments or, or what, but we're not getting the right what to the right who some of the times. And um, that's why I think we have a need for precision neurology. And again, it makes me very excited about this sort of approach with um, iPS cells and organoids. Um, this is just a picture to emphasize we are not all the same. And even if we're people with a label of Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia, we're not all the same. In the past, it's been practical to lump people together with these diagnoses because it kind of gives you an idea of how to counsel patients and what the likely drugs are that, that probably are going to work for them. But within each of the diagnoses, there's a lot of heterogeneity. 
So it's kind of become a barrier at this point to us figuring out how to treat the root cause of neurologic disorders. And this is just a really simple, well, it took forever, but uh, it was a really simple, conceptually simple experiment with some experts in machine learning um, who I worked with back in New York. And we, we took um, clinical data from people who were relatively homogeneous, you know, they all got one diagnosis, um, they're included in a clinical study that was pretty strict. And still, by doing cluster analysis, we could pull out subtypes who had different patterns of symptoms and different types of progression. Um, so I think, you know, going back to um, 2007, this discovery of how to make these induced pluripotent cells by Shinya Yamanaka's team was just absolutely revolutionary. So the fact that you can take skin cells or blood cells and develop out of those these de-differentiated induced pluripotent cells that have a lot of qualities of um, human embryonic stem cells. And um, as Momoko said, you know, you, you can differentiate these into lots of different cell types and um, they can, they can be coaxed in the laboratory. Uh, for example, I had the good fortune to work with uh, Lauren Studer's lab for quite a long time as um, their, their sort of clinical arm. And um, he was seminal in, in, in figuring out how you could take these cells and turn them into dopamine neurons. And actually using similar techniques, um, there was a group based in uh, Mass General Hospital who had a patient with Parkinson's and they could take his IPS, they could take his skin cells, develop IPS cells, and then turn those into dopamine progenitors and transplant them back in an effort to treat his Parkinson's. And I'll never forget being in the OR for that. It was quite an amazing experience. So there are amazing things that have been achieved and including with the IPS cells, this ability to start to study cells from different individuals and start to look at how we can personalize treatments. But brain organoids just seem like one step further. We're now putting those cells into 3D and we're getting them into context and we're giving them partner cells to speak with. So I think this is really um, a place where in human brain disorders, it's a place where organoids can, can help discover what makes us tick. I think it's a very early field clinically, but it really seems like an unprecedented tool um, that we can use to study not only brain function and brain development, but brain dysfunction. Um, these cells are, uh, they, these organoids um, recapitulate, you know, these qualities, um, I hate to say this in front of an expert, but it's like a very small version of an early developing human brain. Then obviously very different, they're not part of an organism. Um, many fewer neurons are involved and, and it's uh, more, more cells than neurons, um, I, I, or different cells than neurons as well. But they do, connect in networks. Um, there have been limitations that have been discussed about the size of these organoids without blood vessels for nourishment, but these are being addressed. And of course, you know, they, they can't learn from the outside world. But um, I did want to bring up, um, there's some really uh, nice papers out there about the translational potential of human brain organoids. And, and this was one that I thought had some really nice points in it. But Really, I want to draw your attention to the bottom left part of the slide and start thinking about how might these organoids be used in the future to inform neurological care of our patients. So they can be used for electrophysiological study to try to define deficits in particular disorders. They can be used um, similarly for disease modeling. They might be used for drug screening and that would lead possibly to personalized therapeutics. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go on and show you a couple of studies that I thought were really interesting. Um, relevant, uh, relevant to Parkinson's disease, it's actually possible to make organoids that, are, um, that recapitulate some of the cell types that are found down in the midbrain, which is where the action is. You know, the substantia nigra is that site of uh, dopamine neurons and um, it's possible to make midbrain organoids. And just looking at this picture right here, um, the, the green is neurons, but actually the red are tyrosine hydroxylase positive neurons. These are the guys that are gonna be making dopamine. And actually in these cultures, they could see that dopamine was being produced. 
And over time, you could see more of these cells. Um, as you say, they're not the only cell types in there. There are other cells as well, and I think that's what makes this so amazingly exciting in terms of starting to understand what are some of the cell interactions. We could grow these. Um, there's a potential to produce these from people with Parkinson's, for example, and start to study how the cells are interacting. And more, <laughs> this, this is um, an interesting study from a few years ago where um, I didn't, there, there, I, there's, this doesn't speak to the um, pathological changes in Parkinson's. This study speaks to pathological changes in Alzheimer's. And this group developed um, iPSC-derived full brain organoids from individuals who had inherited Alzheimer's disease. So this familial, these familial forms of Alzheimer's. And um, I think this really shows the potential for this type of uh, study and using brain organoids. They could see amyloid aggregation and tau hyperphosphorylation. So amyloid down here, this is a control. And then just compare, for example, to this panel right down here from someone with familial Alzheimer's. So more of the amyloid aggregation. Similarly, here's our um, phosphorylated tau control someone, um, organoids from someone with uh, familial Alzheimer's, really quite different. So proof of principle that we can um, see, observe pathology that's relevant to the pathology in the human brain of people with specific disorders. So I'm gonna stop right there. Um, so we have some time for questions. But I think just to summarize, there have been really enormous strides in um, neurology and clinical neuroscience over the last few years. And it's a really interesting, I mean, it's just an exciting time to be involved in neurology right now. We've had advances in genetics, in molecular biology, cell biology, medical technology, stem cell technologies, although still some limitations with the windows on the brain. So I'm hopeful that it's very early days, but I'm really hopeful that this type of technology and the ability to develop brain organoids um, like the ones you saw from Momoko, is really going to help us to study cell function, help us study cell dysfunction in 3D, not in pure isolated, um, uh, pure, pure cells in a dish, but in 3D arrays with relevant partner cells. And I think it might also open up the ability to, um, to develop a more uh, a precision, a more personalized way of um, treatment by looking at the nuances of the differences between different patients with one overall diagnosis. Thanks. That was wonderful in terms of timing. Um, thanks to both of you. I am going to stop the share here and um, invite some questions from the audience. Remember, this is what we're going for, is to try and have a more interactive format as we're all seeking to emerge from having been in our houses um, and, and uh, in a heavily Zoom environment. Um, <laughs> I have a number of things that are not relevant. <laughs> so we can go to our Q&A. Um, I think what might work best is Momoko and Claire, if I could invite you guys to come to the front because I think the way we're gonna to have to do this is to read out questions to the audience and then also invite questions from the audience, but speak into the microphone and repeat them for sure. our hybrid audience. So the first one we have here is Dr. Henchcliffe, what are your thoughts on the potential of brain organoids to understand behavior supported by distributed cortical networks? Mm -hmm. So cortical is part of the brain, um, such as memory and executive function, given the limited size and complexity of the organoids. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's kind of a mind-blowing question, actually. <laughs> that's a sophisticated <laughs> one. <laughs> that was a great answer, yeah. right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think for Dr. Mapstone, he's picked up on um, some of the limitations and obviously um, we're looking at something much smaller, something less complex, right? And so how can we hope to um, recapitulate these enormously complex networks? So I think um, we, we, we obviously can't. Um, maybe we'll never be able to. But maybe there are some smaller bite-sized chunks, some 
particular aspects, some particular interactions that would be appropriate to um, look at in organoids. And um, by the way, relevant to this, I just wanted to bring up, you know, there's a lot of debate about um, the, the role of organoids um, and how much they differ from um, real, real, real brains and so on. And um, I was reading a, a commentary from UCSF and Arnold Krigstein that actually had a quite nice uh, summary of, of some of the critiques. So I can't, that wasn't a very good answer to Mark Mapstone's question, but it's the best I can do. Well, I wonder if Momoko might want to add on to that, because I think you showed some really nice examples where even the organized models that we have can give potentially some unique insights that we wouldn't be able to get through an animal model. Right, right, yeah. So obviously that's the limitation of organ research right now. It, can, it cannot fully recapitulate the full circuits in our body. Um, so um, that's something we should keep in mind. At the same time, people start to develop more kind of fused systems. So one of the interesting study from uh, uh, Sergey Pasca at Stanford, he kind of fused three different systems. So cortical organoids as well as spinal cord organoids and muscle organoids. And then try to see how the cortical neurons can ask, 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 sorry, a function through the um, um, spinal organoid towards the muscle organoids to actually move the muscle movement. So it's still limited, but people start to um, improve this system um, to fully recapitulate the actual like uh, you know behavior or the movement from the cortical side. So I, I'm very um, optimistic <laughs> that we can probably um, really recapitulate the actual human system, but we do have the limitation right now. And then uh, one of the strengths about UCI, I think we are trying to fuse with the bioengineering technology here mm -hmm. uh, to further enhance the organized system. So I'm gonna ask a follow-up, like Chair's prerogative. I wonder if you want to comment on human, just go back to human brain development, right, where we don't have any models, right? Because I think organoids really give us a huge jump forward in that regard. I'm partial to that because I mentioned our faculty hires for leverage research excellence, but that was all fo focused on organ and tissue engineering. And so this has been a big effort and an investment on the part of the stem cell center in UCI. So maybe just a word there, because I don't know if everybody would necessarily realize that, right? Mm -hmm. There's such big differences between rodents as a model and mm -hmm. humans and what our gaps are. Right, right, right. So, um, and people start to compare the organoid to the actual human tissue. And um, there are some differences, of course, and then um, uh, we, we should be aware of the, what's the limitation, but uh, hopefully we can improve the system. So we have kind of a related question that came in for you, Momoko, which is whether people have used organoid models um, to look at hydrocephalus, and is that feasible as sort of a developmental neurobiological? <laughs> oh, easy one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think it's possible. Um, and um, so uh, we can make the tissue called um, a core plexus, which secretes the cerebral spinal fluid. So it, it's related to the hydrocephalus phenotype. So actually, that could be, um, we can study how the core plexus um, change the cerebral spinal fluid uh, production in, in vitro. So I'm, I'm very hopeful maybe we can model that as well, yeah. So we have a... I'm just gonna add oh, that good, to please, that some, please. Yeah, just uh, from a clinical perspective. Um, I was, uh, also looking, I mean, I spoke about neurodegenerative disorders, but uh, I think there's a huge interest from the neurosurgical community about some of these things, and including hy hydrocephalus, mm -hmm. so a lot of opportunities there. That's great, because I think you know, part of our goal is to have that basic science clinical perspective. Mm -hmm. I just wanna take a moment, we have some more questions that are on the Q&A, but since we're in our experiment mode this evening and we have a bit of a live audience, um, can I ask what questions folks in the audience might have? Oh, that's great. There's a lot. I'm going to go here first. I'm not sure whether this camera is going to follow me or not. So we're going to go first. Maybe I'll shout. Thank you so much. This is so interesting and just amazing, amazing. I don't know. My mind just is 
kind of blowing up with all the possibilities that this offers. I am really interested in trauma, and I'm wondering if you, uh, both from a clinical standpoint and a neurophysiological standpoint as well, and I'm wondering if you played with that, with the organoids, either in a very localized way, yeah. since obviously the, what you just described is the circuitry, not really being able to have that full picture. But I'm just wondering if there is any work going on to traumatize cells in this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great question. We actually have someone in our audience tonight who does that work. Oh, do, what a coincidence. Do, <laughs> do either of you want to take a quick whack or do you just want to kick that to Dr. Yeah, Collins? Yeah, just kick it. All right. <laughs> I, I'm not prepared to speak tonight. <laughs> um, so the answer to your question is, in fact, we are studying taking brain organoids back to now down with the local tissues better at the mind And we're uh, doing micro injuries to the brain organoids in a dish. Mm -hmm. And we're we're actually 3D printing skull cases to put them inside of damaging them and then looking at the injury response over time and looking how the injury response also parallels the damage you see in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Because there's a link between head trauma and Alzheimer's disease as well. Mm -hmm. So those studies are uh, ongoing. There's actually a seed, I like that a seed grant from the Stem Cell Center to do that work. Mm -hmm. uh, and also funding from uh, UCI Mind for uh, Institute of Memory Impairments and Neurological yeah. Disorders. So that work is going. Um, there's also, if you go to our website, there's a, a talk I gave last year, two years ago, about using stem cells to treat brain injury mm -hmm. in, in a, uh, hopefully in a coming clinical trial. Thank you. Uh, I saw a couple. All right, Daniela. Remember, you're on my hand camera. So, excellent presentation. Uh, I was so happy to note that uh, Claire discussed uh, the importance of inflammation and of the immune system in neurological disorders. And I'm hoping that either of you will comment on the ability to interact with the immune system and what is the state of knowledge in bringing actually the immune system and fusing it with our families? So I'll, I have an answer for that. <laughs> so <laughs> do you want to <laughs> start? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, it's very exciting field right now to use the brain organoid to look at the inflammation as well. And I, I, I didn't really go over details about when we infect the brain organoid with Zika virus. Actually, it has innate immune response right away. So even without the immune response cells, uh, they, you know, neural stem cells have the innate immune response and then we can look at the uh, interferon secretion from the um, near stem cells. So um, we can look at that as well as we can put like microglia, which is considered to be brain uh, immune cells. And actually here at UCI, Matthew Blackton Jones, he can make microglia and we, we try to put, uh, we can try to put them into the brain and then look at the microglia and brain uh, interactions. So uh, that, that's something I think possible in the future to look at. Yeah, um, thank you for bringing that up because this has been a bee in my bonnet for years now about how we can better understand the role of um, inflammation. And I just wanted to add to what you said that there's, there's also some space here to understand differences between individual patients. And, you know, I, I, I showed a, a scan with the PK11195 that um, lights up, quote, activated microglia, whatever those are. Um, but what I, I remember when we were doing the study and we, we had people with Parkinson's who were just so different one from the other. So I, I think again, this is a way that we can use these types of systems to look at individual differences. And you have the, the answer. No, I'm oh, welcome to the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I think, Brian, am I correct? I think Matt um, Witten Jones gave a talk also on the website is a, a lecture that featured Matt from so, yes. at some point, which includes seeding brain organoids with microglia. I'm going to throw a question in the middle here just because I saw it on the thread and it kind of follows on from where we are right now. And that was about um, the ability to combine the vasculature, right, and what blood flow would look like, what the impact 
of that would be in terms of brain organoid function and develop. And so, Momoko, I'm sure that you've thought a lot about that, so I'm going to throw it back to you. Yeah, that's another good point. So, um, so vascularization of the brain organoids is something people are working on right now. And one of the most prominent, I think the very famous study done by Rusty Gage at, um, in Salk Institute. So basically he tried to put the um, vascularized, a uh, human vascular cells into the brain organoids. And actually he translated back to the mouse brain and see the human vasculature actually connected to the mouse vasculature. So that was really a fantastic study. And um, he's, to some extent shows the improvement of the architecture of the brain organoid inside of the mouse brain. So that's, um, that's something people start to attempt. And uh, there is another also paper showing, like try to make the vasculature by using the engineering um, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 kind of approach. And that's, that's something ongoing. And with the vasculature, we are hoping that we can grow the brain organoid much bigger and in a long, long run. So uh, that's, that's another exciting field right now, yeah. So I'm just gonna add one piece onto that, mainly probably for our, our virtual audience here, and that's to point out, because we do have a number of investigators in the Stem Cell Center and at UCI who are interested in this, it isn't just blood, having blood presence and the oxygenation, so supplying support um, to the organoids, but there are a lot of tissues in terms of development that are really dependent upon um, mechanosensation. So whether there's flow, whether there's movement, what the tension of that is. And understanding those pieces in organoids may be something that's very important as well. And we have folks that are working on that. Stay tuned for their lectures. I had a question here. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much for a great lecture. I have uh, two, two uh, specific questions. One uh, regards cost, I mean, how much does it cost to develop this idea? Like, let's say I have a couple of organoids where I want to test some drugs or some responses to medications, etc. And the other is how, how old is an old organoid? Like, how, how much can you keep it alive? And if you see changes in that old organoid? Thank you. Do you know anything about the cost? Great question. Cost. Sure. Yes. I know the answer to the first one is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, sorry, so if I understand your question precisely, so you're asking about the brain organoid production cost? Okay, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, more more it, than IPS cell lines, right? Yeah, yeah, so, so more than IPS cell lines, and then as you culture them long, those culture medium to maintain the organoids are really expensive. Uh, I, I don't have the specific estimate for brain organized, but that's something I'm kind of interested in probably looking at in the future. Maybe commercialization of the brain organized would be probably interesting and um, something might be, um, some, a lot of people might be interested in. Uh, but uh, sorry, I don't have specific numbers. <laughs> and uh, maintenance of the organized. So I showed different organoid protocols and then actually each has pros and cons, and one of them called like region-specific spheroid. Uh, so a lot of people report it can sustain a year, uh, three years, and then, um, so that, that, that was the strength of that particular protocol, and start to show some um, uh, cell types which develops later on, like oligodendrocytes, uh, which happens in the human's case, after the baby is born, after uh, half a year, they start to form the oligodendrocyte. So, um, uh, probably I briefly read Ryan's question. So, uh, it really reflects the time course of the actual in vivo development. And it's, I, I, I can safely say it's roughly the same uh, developmental timing as in vivo system. So, um, so it's, it's pretty, yeah. Um, interesting, but it, it's still a challenge to sustain them in the long run. And um, honestly, my, my uh, region-specific organoids, it, it can go up to maybe nine months, but um, it starts to fall apart, meaning that the architecture is not good. Uh, so I can maintain very chunk of ball without the architecture long-term, but like 
sustaining that architecture is very difficult. Yeah. Can I just make a, a comment? Cause I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Nick, if this is what you were getting at, but um, thinking about if you're trying to model diseases. Yes, I was going to ask you to go yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and thinking about you know diseases of uh, aging. So I read a really interesting paper about um, is Parkinson's a neurodevelopmental um, defect and uh, could organoids help us with that? And I think you know it was a lot about um, the uh, some subtleties perhaps of metabolism or um, you know endos endosomal um, function and so on. It's it's like you know the genes. Um, what is it, the genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. But there were a lot of ideas about um, how you might in those cases then be able to use organoids to look at the effects of quote, environment, so perhaps environmental toxins. And actually as you were speaking about um, how long you can culture the organoids, I, I was going to ask, are there ways that you can artificially age them? Can oh. you stress them out? <laughs> um, um. I, I guess you can stress the cells <laughs> by a lot of means. Um, so like if you want to mimic like oxidative stress, maybe you can put like reactive oxygen species in the yeah, culture dish. Exactly. Um, and um, your previous colleague, Lauren Studer, um, I think he kind of showed, not the organoid system, but IPS derived neurons to yeah. activate the uh, progenia, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the one of the older form of yeah. the nuclear envelope to really mimic the aging process. So yeah. those could be done using the iPSL uh, derived organoids in the future, and it can probably speak up to aging. And um, that's one of the very exciting field right now. Yeah. Right. So I just want to very briefly un unpack one thing that you mentioned, Claire. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying this, because it's so much nicer for me to host this with an audience. I can't have, to have you guys here, I can't even tell you. So. I hope that's true for everyone. Um, but I want to unpack something that you said, because I think it's this kind of discussion that's really informative for the community. Um, it's kind of something that both of you said. And that's in terms of models, right? So time matters. And that's one thing that it's really challenging for us to unpack in the mm -hmm. models that we have in a lab. A uh, rodent completes their developmental stage. They're ready to go on and have progeny and you know be behave like adults by the time they're three or four weeks old. Obviously, in humans, the time course of that is very, very different, and that's because just how these cells expand and grow, mm -hmm. when they start to develop networks, when you have insulation forming, myelination as a process is different by years between the models that we use to imagine what's going on in disease and what's really happening in the human condition. And so to be able to have something that's a human cell and on a human clock really changes the game in terms of what our understanding may be potentially. So I don't know, do you want to add to that at all? I just wanted to make sure that that came through for the lay audience from, yeah. from your comments. Yeah, um, no, nothing to add. I think you expressed it really clearly. Okay. Um, we do have maybe maybe just one more question I'd like to or two um, I'd like to highlight. Lee Turner, who is in our online audience tonight, is a new recruit to UCI. Welcome, Lee. We're super happy to have him here. He's starting our new ethics center, and he's been super active in terms of um, the well where ethics and stem cells meet, if you will. <laughs> um, and so his question is, oh, his. Is it? Okay, thank you. His question uh, is to you, Claire, is do you have any advice concerning how stem cell researchers can communicate with the public about organoids in an evidence-based manner that avoids hyperbole and scaremongering? How do you try and frame conversations with journalists, for example, that might be asking about brain organoids and disease implications? Yeah. Um, that's great. I, I think this harks back to many years of discussing these questions around stem cells in general. And actually when we started thinking about a transplant um, a clinical trial in Parkinson's that was using cells that had been developed from stem cells, we, we got a bioethicist and actually she was a philosopher of science on board. And um, we talked a lot about how we get best communication. And then when we're enrolling people into clinical trials, how 
we can do the best we can with um, a proper informed consent. So I think this is not something we can do as individuals. We try to do it as individuals, but we really need larger organizations to be able to help us. And so I say, you know, for um, some, for example, mm -hmm. um, into, uh, the ISSCR, uh, the, uh, um, there, there are many professional organizations, I think, who are really looking at this. So I, I think as individuals, um, you know, as physicians, we get asked about this quite a lot, so we can do our best to stay with the science and, and stay with the facts. But I think it's also important that we all get involved with these organizations and, um, you know, contribute um, our, our understanding that it can be communicated best out to the public. It's, it's a tough one. It's a hard one, for sure. So I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. It, it, we're about seven minutes after, so maybe just one or two more super brief questions so that our audience can flee. Um, so one question is, are there ways to create models containing multiple types of organoids and determine how they interact together? And Momoko, you had touched on this a little bit. So do you want to just come back and fill in? Yeah, sure. So um, as I mentioned, fusion system or assembloid systems to uh, really see the interaction of di uh, different type of types of brain regions as well as different outside of the brain systems are start to emerge. And um, so, so that's, that's um, th something uh, that the field is going toward right now. And as well as um, I would like to emphasize again, like bioengineering technology actually help looking at different cell types using the like uh, compartmentalized chambers as well. So um, I, I think it's ongoing. <laughs> um, and if if you have anything to add on to that, no, I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And then um, Claire, just a last question to you, and it's about ALS as opposed to Parkinson's. Is there oh. a role for organoids in ALS? research and what sorts of things what we think we could see in terms of advances there? How might it yeah, help our study I, of ALS? I, well, I'm going to say, um, I, I think that that's a great question. There are a lot of overlaps actually with Parkinson's. You know, if you talk about um, patients with ALS, they're, they're also different um, one than the other. And um, there's the motor component of ALS, but there are also non-motor components of ALS. So I can see a lot of um, areas where we really need better understanding. So some different, some of the different region specific organoids they think could help us to understand how the cells are functioning, communicating, not communicating. Um, I'd be really interested to know a little more about how that could be used for um, drug screening, drug discovery. Um, and uh, we, we already know some of the genetics, for example, in ALS, so that could be a good place to start. Um, yeah. We know there, well, we know a lot about mitochondrial dysfunction and energy metabolism and neuroinflammation and, and so on. So I think that there are multiple of these areas where organoids could be um, contributory. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from the audience as a thank you to you guys for being our guinea pigs? <laughs> All right, with that, I'd like to just thank um, you guys for being here with us, helping us uh, in this grand experiment, and certainly our virtual audience for joining us. We'll keep you updated. Um, I think we'd be glad to hear from people with their comments and thoughts on, um, hopefully this was a more engaging format than a straight Zoom, but let us know because we need to figure out what our next steps are. Thank you very much for coming tonight with the map.